Hello, I'm Britton Clement, and welcome to China Insight, where we discuss the latest issues affecting this rapidly changing country. Well, today on the show, we're taking you to the roof of the world, to the Tibetan Autonomous Region, where farming and medicine are helping the economy plow ahead. Someone who has witnessed the changes to Tibet's agricultural sector over the last couple of decades is Professor Liu Yonggong from the China Agricultural University, and he's joining us in the studio today. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for the invitation. What triggered your interest in Tibet? What kind of drew you there?、Uh, as consultant, agricultural development consultant, and consultant for poverty alleviation in Tibet, I focused on agricultural project and rural development project and poverty alleviation project. So.、Uh, Uh, designing the project and also、uh, promoting the local team capacity building, as well as evaluation for such kind of、uh, agricultural development project. Okay, well, I want to go into the nitty-gritty with you a little bit more、yeah. after this video.、Yeah. I travelled to the Himalayan region to check out Tibet's unique agriculture and traditional medicines. Let's take a look. We start our journey in Yingchi County. An area in southwest Tibet, touched by beauty at every turn, where Mother Nature's gifts have influenced the lives of people in a big way. This village is framed by sprawling forests and grasslands as far as the eye can see. It's called Lulang, which means a place where the dragon lives, or a place that will make you forget your home. And I think that really captures the magical, the mystical quality of the area. And that is why tourists are drawn to it. With food and accommodation readily available, it's become a popular pit stop for backpackers making their way across Tibet. That's also why some of the locals have transformed their homes into hostels. So this is an example of one of the family hotels set up here. This one is called Uncle Pingtuo Hotel, and we want to go check it out and speak to Uncle Pingtuo himself. Let's go. 哎、hey, ，你好 ，Uncle Pinto 啊，你好吗？啊、uh, ，很高兴认识你，我是 Brit、嗯。你叫什么名字？我是平座大叔。啊，好好，看看一下。嗯嗯。陈坤、啊、有名的人吗？呃、啊，对对对，有名的人，行走的。Uncle Pinto tells us business is going well. He's got more than a dozen rooms to let. It's not his only business, however. This entrepreneur also makes leather goods and maintains a farm. This is another example of Uncle Pinto's enterprise. He's actually made this bag and sells them. It's quite remarkable how enterprising Uncle Pinto is, isn't it? Thanks to Nyingchi County's fertile soil and many waterways. The area is becoming a thriving agricultural hub, and much of what is grown is used in Tibetan medicine, which has a history of more than 2,000 years and is now one of the world's leading forms of traditional medical treatment. It's used by people across the globe. So this woody brown fungus that I've got in my hand is supposed to be extremely good for your health. It's grown in these greenhouses behind me on this farm, and then it's taken to be processed at medical factories. The plants are cultivated by Nima, who says he's reaping the benefits of a high demand for traditional medicine. Around 80% of Tibetans are farmers or herders, so it's no wonder that traditional agriculture forms the framework of the economy. But these days, new hydroculture technology, growing with water instead of soil, is opening up a whole range of new options for Tibetan farmers. 
At Red River Valley Farm, we found a greenhouse testing out hydroponic growing systems. At this farm, they're using creative growing techniques. Hydroponic systems mean that you don't need soil to grow your produce. And then over here, vertical farming, that means that you can kind of circumvent any issues you might have with space. Another plus of using these kinds of systems is that growing can continue even when the weather conditions are at their harshest, including times of drought or when temperatures plummet in winter. And lately, many plants are being cultivated that aren't native to the region, opening up a new potential customer base. Indeed, it comes as a surprise to see South American crops like maca and quinoa cultivated in Tibet. We're told that the conditions for growing these plants are similar to those in the Peruvian highlands. Quinoa, dubbed a super grain because of its protein-rich, high mineral content, is taking the health food industry by storm. That's fueled a desire to grow the adaptable plant here. And in the early 1990s, officials approved Tibet's first quinoa cultivation project. After a few failed attempts to find the right varieties that would suit the environment and conditions on the plateau, quinoa production began in earnest in 2010. To meet growing demand in the food and health industries, organic farming is also on the rise in Tibet. To find out more, we visit a model organic farm on the outskirts of the regional capital. Lhasa Pure Land is a 4,000 square meter agricultural zone, which, since 2013, has grown a range of produce, all without chemicals or pesticides. And among its products are some rather surprising plants. The most commonly grown crop in Tibet is barley, but on this organic model farm outside of Lhasa, they're doing something a little bit different. With the mindset of quality over quantity, they're growing exotic herbs, fruits and flowers, like this lavender field that you'd never expect to see here. It seems they're bringing a little bit of the French Provence to Tibet. Lhasa Pure Land products can be bought on e-commerce websites and people here have big ambitions to market them abroad. If all goes to plan, more farms like Lhasa Pure Land are expected to be established across the area. That's also made it easier to transport the more than 50 different types of produce to factories like this one, where they're processed and packaged, ready for the shelf. The Gunlu Pharmaceutical Company produces dozens of different Tibetan medicines for treating a range of illnesses from the flu and lung disease to sore limbs and sleeping disorders. From making medicine from Tibetan herbs to producing beer with Tibetan barley. We visit the Lhasa Beer Factory for a taste of what Tibet's highest and only brewery produces. Made with Himalayan spring water and barley harvested from nearby farms, Lhasa Beer is a European-style lager which made its debut in the U.S. in 2009. And it's enjoyed by beer aficionados around the world.
So here I am drinking from the highest brewery in the world where they make Lhasa beer. And I've heard it's kind of almost like a European lager, all malt taste. But let's have a little bit of a try. I'm no beer expert, but it's kind of got this aromatic, clean taste. Shabda! After that quick palate cleanser, it was back on the road to check out a lake on the border between Dam Shun and Bangoin counties. And it didn't disappoint. You might think I'm by the seaside, but I'm actually 5,000 meters above sea level. The glittering turquoise of Namso Lake in my eyes is just another testament to the real natural beauty of Tibet. Namso is the largest saltwater lake in Tibet and attracts busloads of marvelling tourists each day. Our journey then takes us back to Lhasa, a city of contrasts. Although hints of modernity are seen all over, with development very much a focus for officials, Visitors are still attracted by its ancient holy sites. And I'd say, like, the palace, so gigantic for the time when it was built. And that just amazes me, of, like, the scope of how huge it is. Joghang Temple is the most revered destination for pilgrims to Lhasa. They circle the site clockwise in a meditative state in a process known as a kora, while tourists weave between them. Very culture, uh, different, I mean, absolutely different culture than we are used to, of course. And um, they're not as progressive, of course, as we are. And uh, I, I love it. I absolutely love it because they're so different, maybe. When people usually think of Tibetan landmarks, this is usually what comes to mind, the iconic Patala Palace. Standing at more than 3,600 meters, it's the highest palace in the world and a symbol of Tibetan culture. Tens of thousands of Tibetans come through here each year to worship and tourists flock to marvel at it. And it's not hard to see why. The Patala Palace is the historic home of the Dalai Lamas. It lies between the city's ancient east and modern west. Lhasa became the capital of Tibet during the 17th century, but it's probably changed more in the past few decades than at any time in its history. The Patala Palace is the spiritual heart of Tibet and on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites. That's why visitors say it's so important that it's kept maintained. But preservation can be a challenge, given the hordes of tourists shuffling through. Last year alone, 830,000 people visited the palace. Concerned about maintaining the ancient site, officials have now limited daily tourist numbers. Tamnigajanza from growing crops using progressive techniques and age-old know-how to finding modern ways of preserving ancient structures. 
It's this contrast between the old and the new, modernization and tradition, that will continue to be an important balancing act for Tibet as it heads into the future. After all, it's this combination of natural wonder and spiritual pulse that makes the roof of the world so very unique. So that was part of my journey in Tibet. I'd like you to paint a picture of, of the agricultural landscape. Uh, the whole Tibet is uh, 1.2 million square kilometers. However, the arable land is very limited. The total arable land is about uh, 420,000 hectares. Most of those arable land are located in the lower valley land area. Right. About uh, two-thirds two -third of those, those arable land is uh, cultivated, mm. mainly for producing Tibetan barley, potatoes, and rap seeds. In some uh, suburb area like uh, Lhasa and also prefecture cities, uh, intensive farming, modern farming, uh, has been developed very quickly in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, for example, greenhouses, like uh, the video mm. show. Uh, Soilless growing techniques. Uh, yes, uh, hydroponic uh, cultivation and water-saving agriculture, greenhouse vegetable production, greenhouse uh, mushroom uh, production. Why is it so important that, that we use greenhouses and these, these different kind of growing techniques? That's a good, that's good question because the uh, high uh, altitude, okay. the, the temperature in the night is very, very low. Mm. Uh, they have uh, sufficient uh, sunshine and the temperature during the daytime is sufficient for growing of the, most of the plants. However, in the night, it's a very low temperature. Mm. In Beijing and other areas where the pollution uh, is a problem, perhaps it's appealing to get um, vegetables and uh, fruit from, from the Tibetan Autonomous Region. That's right. Actually, the ecosystem, the natural environment is very suitable for producing vegetables uh, in uh, uh, organic food or green and food standard, yeah. which is actually high quality comparing with, uh, with the product in, produced in inland provinces. Mm. Uh, in the open production system, uh, farmers don't need to, have to apply uh, pesticides, so they, they can grow the, the vegetable without uh, uh, attack for insect or other other diseases and so on. Like we saw with Lhasa Pure Land, exactly, their commitment exactly. to no pesticides, no chemicals. Exactly, exactly. And particularly in some uh, remote county sub suburb, the environment is entirely very pure, mm. without any pollution. Right. Air is very clean, water is very clean, uh, farmers don't apply any pesticides. Mm. So those products, particularly the vegetables, can be uh, qualified as organic right. products or green food products. Mm. How are they selling? Uh, actually, there are some traders and, and transport teams and so on buying the products from individual farmers and, and then transport to, uh, to, uh, to Lhasa and mm. to the prefecture cities and so on. Actually, the value chain, uh, market chain is somehow developed so farmers can easily uh, sell their products to outside. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, of course, the vegetable can also provide uh, vitamin uh, food uh, sources for, for farmers. Traditionally, Tibetan herders, they, do, they don't grow. They didn't grow the vegetable, and they can also not have such kind of vegetables. Mm -hmm. So, you know, vegetables are sources of... Uh, uh, vitamins. Mm. So this is actually not only for cash income, but also it's very important for Tibetan uh, health. Mm. And we saw, like with Uncle Ping Tsuo, some farmers are diversifying their industry, you know, even just with the arts and craft and, and, and things like that. What's your take on that? That's right. Actually, uh, eco ecotourism. Uh, eco eco tourism or cultural tourism is one of the very very quick developed sector. Also, as uh, 
uh, income sources for 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 Tibetan farmers and herders. Mm. So uh, uh, for ecotourism, actually, uh, Tibetan traditional culture like uh, uh, dancing and and also ha uh, handicrafts. So. Handiwork uh, products is very, 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 very good for outside visitor to take away to buy and so on. Mm. Eco lodge can also combine uh, the eco ecological activities, for example, eco hiking to mm. the mountains, and also enjoying the traditional Tibetan farming activities mm. for outside visitors, inland inland visitors, and also foreign visitors this is very very interesting yeah. so for those kind of activities actually uh, farmers can get income mm. this is a non farming income that leads me to the question of sustainability how important is sustainability uh, for Tibet's future and how is it being approached it's sustainability or uh, sustainable development is, uh, is a high priority in the autonomous reasons development strategy. So I, I heard that in the uh, 13th five years plan, the autonomous region government adopted so-called sustainable green development as a major strategy. So, you know, the ecosystem in Tibet is very, very fragile. So if you overuse the grassland, also overuse the arable land, cause the degradation of vegetation. So the, in the high plateau area, so the ecosystem cannot be rehabilitated by itself. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important to uh, uh, adopt the sustainable development, not overuse the grassland, mm -hmm. for example, for, uh, uh, for grazing. Overgrazing can cause a very, very severe and quick degradation of uh, grassland. Therefore, the government try to introduce the eco-compensation system, try to reduce the stocking number for reducing the grazing capacity. To uh, provide an uh, incentive. Intensity. Yeah, yeah. To provide an incentive. Yes, yes. For being so, green. Yes, yes. So uh, in some area, the eco-compensation provide actually, I think, about 40% of the farmer's or herder's income. That means farmers, herders agree to reduce the stocking number and get the money from the government as a compensation for their livelihood. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very, very important. Also, the so-called uh, blue sky and clean water must be conserved because uh, this is the unique uh, ecosystem, nature. Of course, important for not just food security, exactly. but also for tourism. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so we're going to talk more about tourism in the next part, but we're going to take a quick break. Please stay with us. Welcome back to China Insight. I'm with China Agricultural University Professor Liu Yonggong, and we've been talking about the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Well, we took to the streets to ask people what they think of Tibet and what their impressions are. Let's take a look. Hi, just want to ask you, what do 西藏啊，反正是在我印象当中就跟天堂一样，挺美的。西藏的印象就是布达拉宫、蓝天白云，太美了。牦牛，想去，特别想去。西藏是高原，呃，空气稀薄，一般身体不好可能到那儿不行。
I agree with them. So in terms of tourism, what do you predict for the future? Do you uh, see more, more, you know, like Uncle Pinsuo's type lodges, you know, you said eco-lodges. Yeah. Do you see that being attractive to more and more people in the future? The number of uh, tourists uh, are increasing year by year. I think averagely it's uh, 5 to 10 percent. So I five think... 5 to 10 percent jump each year, is that right? Yes, yes. So I think uh, e eco-tourism, cultural tourism is uh, one of the very, very attractive uh, mm area for the outside visitors, both for inland visitors as well as for foreign visitors. Which I guess is why it's so important to preserve and, um, you know, put an emphasis on sustainability because people do want that authentic experience. Exactly. Right? For by increasing of the tourist number, I think the eco uh, pressure, ecosystem pressure will be also increased. In such a, a fragile ecosystem, uh, more visitors means also high pressure. So that uh, I think uh, in the future, the local government should uh, uh, develop sustainable eco tourism strategy, not just uh, uh, promoting increase the number of visitors, should also control the number. Mm. of the visitors. Right, like we saw at the Tyler Palace, the numbers, they had to cap the numbers exactly. because the tourists exactly. were just coming through so thick and fast that it was exactly. damaging. Right. Exactly. Mm. Particularly uh, the infrastructure, transportation infrastructure in the past two decades was developed very quickly. So access to uh, remote areas now is possible. Mm -hmm. So the higher the altitude, the fragile, the ecosystem, Therefore, for eco-tourist development in such high altitude area should uh, control the number of the visitors. Right, because more people have access to these kind of altitudes, yes. so yes. It's, it's quite a shock to the system. Exactly. Preservation, conservation of the Tibetan culture is also very important as development of uh, a tourism sector, so more outside visitors and enjoy the indigenous culture, religions and traditions. They want that experience. Yes, yes. However, so to also conserve the, uh, the buildings and also the Tibetan indigenous culture, including religions and so on and so forth, for future development. Tourism is an important sector, however, should consider to conserve the ecosystem and also the culture. Okay, I think that's a great place to end it. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. That's my pleasure. If you have any comments or questions, email us at chinainsight at cctv.com or you can find us on Facebook, Weibo and WeChat. And we'll see you next time for more stories and discussion on China, out of China. Goodbye.